2. Titus chapter number 2, we'll look at verses 3 through 5. Titus 2, 3 through 5. The Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Last week in our study of Titus 2, we saw six characteristics that God gave or expects from the aged men. And Titus 2.2, 2, the Bible says that the aged men be sober, be grave, be temperate, sound in the faith, in charity, in patience. And these characteristics, uh, by the way, are not suggestions. They're what God is looking for in aged men, the mature men of the faith. And uh, they're considered uh, by God to be normal, maturing of the faith, not extraordinary. Not extraordinary. In other words, uh, when God wrote this, he didn't say, well, I'm hoping that at least one out of ten will make it. No, this is what God says is normal for a maturing man of the faith to be, that he would be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, in charity, and in patience. And then, so we see that word aged, I told you last week, that doesn't mean that it's a old gray-haired man like Brother David uh, Robinson. Uh, it would be uh, just a, a man who's mature in the faith and not, not necessarily having gray hair and old of years, but really mature in the faith. And like I said, they're not suggestions. This is what happens to a normal Christian man as his faith matures and as his understanding of the word matures and he understands more, he is absolutely going to grow and be mature in the faith and these things will be more evident in his life. And that brings us to chapter number, uh, excuse me, uh, verse number three, where the Bible says the aged women likewise. So what does that mean? It means that God didn't say, men, this is what I want you to do, and say, ladies, you get a free pass. Sorry, that's not what he said. He said, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so same situation here when uh, women are of the faith and they begin to mature in their faith. These characteristics should be also a part of their life. It's what's normal. It's not, it's like I said, it's not extraordinary. It should be normal for women to grow and mature in their faith. And so we see nine things that the aged women are commanded to be or do. Number one, be in behavior as becometh holiness, which basically means this, actions that are befitting of someone who is reverent toward the things of God. Uh, how could that, you know, that's pretty simple, but yet there's a lot of ladies who struggle. And uh, one of the things that they struggle with sometimes is their husbands uh, do not do what they're supposed to do. And so a lot of times ladies think that that gives them license not to do what they're supposed to do. And we know we serve a God who is full of grace and mercy, and, and uh, we have to answer personally for our behavior. And if you're a lady, the Bible says, be in behavior as becometh holiness. So, you know, we don't have that privilege. And the same is true with men. You know, we can't, a man can't say, well, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be sober, be grave, be temperate, sound in the faith and charity and patience. Well, I can't be patient because you don't know my wife. No excuse. Bible says that's what we're supposed to be as aged men, and the same here for the ladies. And then number two, teachers of good things. A teacher of goodness. What is goodness? Well, according to God's word, it is the things that uh, uh, you know, show Christ's likeness. They're, they're things that 
you know, people could observe in you and say, hey, you know what, that's a, that's a good thing that they're doing. They're, they're really uh, focused in on trying to serve God and, and let their life and their, and their work be a testimony to the fact that God has given them a new heart and, and all those things. Uh, a teacher of goodness. Number three, teach the young women to be sober, which means to be in control of one's senses, to be moderate, uh, spirit-controlled. I think probably if I was to ask you to, to give me a testimony, ladies, you probably would say that, maybe you wouldn't, but I, I think you might, if you're being honest. Emotions sometimes raise havoc with ladies because that's the way God built them. He gave them, he gave them a sensitivity to emotions where men typically, uh, they're not as emotional. Amen? Uh, and if they are emotional like ladies, then there's another problem. It's called infeminine. And we got a lot of those guys in our society today, right? Not that it's not uh, okay for a man to cry or anything like that, but men should be stronger. They should be able to control their emotions and be able to do the things that they need to do uh, and not let their emotions get the best. But women are not built the same. Uh, women have a greater struggle with emotions. And, you know, we, we won't get into all the physiological things that go into that, but uh, just to say that the, the aged women are supposed to teach the young women to be sober, to be spirit-controlled, uh, to be in control of the senses and the emotions, and be moderate. Don't be up here one day and down here the next, and over here and over there, and uh, like a moving target. Amen? So, number four, they're supposed to love their husbands. Amen? I, I think that's pretty easy for most women. Amen? Amen? amen. <laughs> Althea, I didn't get an amen from you. Amen. amen. Uh, love their husband, which means to be kind and to be affectionate and all the things that go into that. I mean, you know, th folks, this isn't anything, you know, deep spiritually speaking. It's, it's basically just what the Bible says. And then to love their children, uh, which means to have a maternal instinct to to desire for your children to grow up godly. You know, I, your preacher used to say all the time, uh, we're not interested in having good kids. We are interested more in having godly kids. Amen? And that's not going to happen uh, by, uh, you know, uh, just by chance. Uh, kids grow up to be godly when their parents are godly and their parents understand the importance of raising a child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you say to me that you love your children, but you don't raise them up in the admonition of the Lord, then really you're not loving them like God wants you to love them because that's the greatest uh, show when you teach your kids uh, the, the God of the Bible and teach them to desire them and desire to grow up and be godly. And then to be discreet. Number six, to be discreet, which means to be in control of their thinking. And again, comes back to the emotions, curbing their, their appetites for uh, you know, high highs and low lows and just sort of not having to be the center of attention, uh, not having to be uh, out in the front all the time, making a big show of things and, you know, just being discreet and sort of being in the background and, and uh, remember to be the help meet that God wants you to be to your husband. And that means pushing, you know, pushing him up and then to be chaste, which means to cause others to be reverent towards God. If you're, if you're around other young women, ladies, and you're a mature lady and aged women of the faith, uh, the other ladies are going to see you and they're going to say, well, you know, boy, I just wish I could be more like her. I wish I could just love God the way she loves God. I wish I could have the testimony that she has. I, I just, I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. And, and you have that sort of, you're, you're sort of uh, rubbing off, if you will, on that person and you're affecting them in a good manner. Uh, causing others, because of your behavior, to be reverent towards God as well. Uh, to be pure from carnality. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy for we Christians to be carnal. Amen? Uh, because our flesh is still around, and it's still there, and we still have to battle that thing every day. And then number eight, to be keepers at home. Uh, which basically means to be stayers at home. Uh, seeing to the affairs of the home and the family and making sure that the members of the family are, are getting the things that they need and, and sort of being the, 
the, uh, the engineer of the home in the sense that you're making, uh, making the family, uh, giving the family the attention that they need to, to be uh, what they're supposed to be in all areas, especially the part about uh, uh, being, uh, being a godly mom and being reverent for the things of God and teaching the family. God is ultimately holding the husband responsible to see that this all takes place. But uh, moms play a very important role in the age of women are supposed to be keepers at home. And, uh, you know, this is a hard thing in our day because the world is constantly shoving down your, our throats everything opposite of that. Uh, where women are supposed to be equal of men and they're supposed to go out and, you know, f why doesn't the woman get the same pay that a man gets and all these other things. I wonder if they've ever stopped to think about the fact that why are women sometimes in those positions where they question things? Well, maybe it's just because God doesn't want you there. I don't know. I'll leave that alone. Amen. And then number nine, to be obedient to their own husbands. Think about this. If you're obedient to your own husband, which means to arrange themselves under to be in subjection to your husband, which the Bible says we're supposed to be as ladies, uh, how in the world can you be a career woman? Not sure you can be. Uh, because if you're a career woman, that means that you're answering to someone other than your husband for probably the majority of your time. And if you're if you're in that place, uh, how can you be obedient to their own husbands? Because I'll tell you this, I don't know a woman that would probably tell me this would be true. Uh, I mean, wouldn't be true. If, if their boss called and said, hey, listen, I need you to work overtime this weekend. And your husband says, well, no, we have a plan at the beach for this weekend. Or we're going camping, we're going hiking, whatever it is. Uh, so you can't work. Uh, I don't know too many women that would say to their boss, well, I, I can't work because my husband says I can't. These are things that God commands the aged women to be and do. And so when we, we, we then see three things, so those are the things that they're supposed to do, and then we see three things that the aged women are not to do or not to be. Number one, not to be false accusers, which means basically prone to slander, making false accusations without any facts or proof. Can I just tell you, be transparent for a second. In all the ministry work that I've been involved with over the last 20 plus years, the greatest problems for me in ministry have come from women. Uh, doesn't, shouldn't be that way, but it is. And so you say, well, geez, those women should knock that off. Well, really what instead should happen is the husband should get a hold of their wife and make them not be that way. Most of my issues have been with women. And uh, it's because the women oftentimes run the home and they want to run the church. And that's not the way God wants it to be. And so instead what's happened, they're prone to slander. They make accusations. They, they tell, tell you that you're something that you're not and, and uh, make these kinds of you know, uh, you know, statements and so on and so forth. And, and I'm, I'm sure if I was to poll pastors across the country, 99% of the problems come, from past, come to pastors from women in the church. Sorry, that's just the way it is statistically. And uh, I wish it wasn't that way because it doesn't put a pastor in a very good spot when they have to deal with those things. Uh, I would rather fight with a pit bull dog than get involved in those, yeah. truthfully. Uh, so... So uh, not to be false accusers. Then number two, not given to much wine, which means not to be a drinker. Okay? Uh, you say, well, much wine, what does that mean? How much is too much? I think the best thing to do is stay away altogether. And then you won't have to worry about how much is too much. Amen? Did you have a question, Sister Alice? Alice, did you have a question? Okay, well, you put your hand up like you were getting ready to... One glass. One, well, okay, one glass. Is, she says one glass is too much, so now you know how much too much is. Amen. Uh, so, you know, the minute that you take a drink of alcoholic beverage, your body immediately goes into action because the alcohol that is in alcoholic drink 
is poison to your body, literally poison. Now, you wouldn't hear people say that, but that is the medical truth. Your liver immediately kicks into action the minute that you take your first drink of alcohol, and it has to go into defense mode because you're putting something in your body that should not be there. And so when you say too much wine, how much wine is too much? Like Alice said, I think one drink is, not one glass, one drink is too much, too much. But uh, I'll leave that to you. Not, uh, number three, not to allow God's word to be blasphemed, uh, which means to speak reproachfully about the Bible. Uh, I heard a woman recently say uh, through counseling uh, that, uh, uh, you know, made sport of the word of God. And that's blaspheming. To, that's blaspheming God's word. When you make sport about the word of God or the things of God or the commandments of God, you have just stepped over and you have blasphemed uh, uh, God himself and his word. Uh, so we, we should never, ladies, never be in the place where you're uh, bringing reproach. And, and truthfully, the ladies are better at this than the men oftentimes. More of this happens more with men than it does the ladies. You know, it's funny because most churches in America have probably more ladies in them than they do men. Uh, ladies have more sense when it comes to the Bible than men oftentimes. Uh, I know my wife is, is very good at, at reading her Bible and studying and doing the things that she needs to do. And uh, every once in a while she'll catch me and she'll say, that's not what the Bible says. And uh, she couldn't do that if she wasn't doing her work and studying. Uh, but to publicly or privately call God's word into question means that you're blaspheming uh, God's word, and we never should be in place to do that. Um, a perfect example of this is given to us uh, uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter number three. You know the story where, uh, where Eve, Adam and Eve were, were uh, uh, Eve was beguiled by the serpent. And if you, if you look, I'll just read it to you for the sake of time, but if you looked at Genesis three, verses two and three, uh, the Bible said there, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. What just happened? Eve basically spoke reproachfully about God's word because she said something that was not true. And uh, that's been a problem throughout history. Uh, we, we are all guilty sometimes when we try to quote scripture without really remembering what exactly it says, and we just sort of throw out what we think it says, and oftentimes we get it wrong. And we don't want to be doing that because we have the book, we can just read it for ourselves. If you're interested in being able to give out scripture without looking, then it's best to memorize and make sure you memorize it correctly and you memorize the King James Bible, amen? Anytime the Bible is made of none effect, or is questioned as to its authority, either by men or by women, it is blasphemed. And God doesn't take lightly to that. He takes that very seriously. Uh, when God's word is misapplied, when we try to apply a part of scripture to a situation where it's got no business being applied, that's blasphemy. Uh, when we try to teach God's word and we teach it falsely, that is blasphemy. It's a serious thing. And that's why it's so important to be studied up, prayed up, uh, make sure you have your notes written in such a fashion that you can see them and understand them, uh, make sure that you have it laid out so it's, it flows as a presentation. And uh, that all takes time to do. And uh, I think I've told you before, you know, my greatest, uh, greatest part of my week is taken up by, by studying for messages and teaching. And, and oftentimes, uh, a lot of the other things uh, have to get filled in in the other areas of the time throughout the week because we want to make sure that we get God's word uh, said correctly. Many of God's chosen were severely rebuked and are at present under extreme chastisement for their sin of blasphemy. Who am I speaking about? I'm speaking about the Jewish population. Many of the Jews today, if they're not born again, they're still under the rebuke of God for their blasphemy and their, their rejection of God's word and uh, holding it for what it was intended to be. Let's look at one more passage and then we'll close. Look at Matthew chapter number 12. This is an, another principle illustrated from God's word and I want you to see this one because it's pretty important. 
Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 is a, is a, a turning point in God's word, specifically beginning in verse number 24. Uh, from Matthew 12, verses 24 through 32, uh, the, the focus of Christ takes a change and he goes in a totally different direction as a result of this passage. Look at Matthew 12, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So what did they just do? They just basically called Jesus a devil. And Jesus knew their thoughts. That's, that's kind of a sobering fact, isn't it? Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except the, he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now let me just tell you a couple things. First of all, if you're a believer and you've been born again the Bible way, you cannot commit this sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Because what Christ is talking about here is when the Holy Ghost spoke to you back in the day and you came under the conviction of your sin and you came under the conviction of the fact that you were lost and undone without Christ and you were a sinner and you were on your way to hell and the Spirit came on you and brought you to that place in your mind and your heart, you said, I want to be saved. And God gloriously saved you. What he's talking about here is when that happens, that scenario I just gave you happens to a person. And instead of saying, I want to be saved, they say, I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. I don't want to do this. What they're basically saying is they're saying the spirit of God is not going to work on me and it's not going to happen. I'm not interested. I don't want it. And they walk away and they've rejected the Holy Spirit of God. If they continue in their rejection, then they will die and they will go to hell, and just like it says, their sin will not be forgiven them. See? So, when we think about this passage of Scripture, what was happening here was, the Lord was teaching, and the Pharisees were in the neighborhood, and they were listening, and they were trying to just bring discredit on his teaching, and because they thought that they were more spiritual and religious than he was, and all this other stuff, and he basically just cut it straight. And he said, look at it. Uh, you know, and, and oftentimes people will reject Christ the most just before they're born into the family of God. I know for personal experience, uh, people that I have known, that I have witnessed to, just before they're born again, they put up the biggest fight of all. Here in the scriptures, you see the Pharisees are doing exactly that. Does that mean any of these people were born again? I don't know. The Bible doesn't really tell us, but the truth of the matter is they were so religious that they couldn't see past the end of their nose. They couldn't see that he was offering them something great. And so from this point in the Gospel of Matthew, from this point all the way to the Matthew chapter number uh, what, 28, uh, Christ changes focus. He takes the Jewish community, the, 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 the chosen people, and he says, okay, you guys are the religious hot shots of your day. If this is the way you're going to handle it, here we go. I'm taking you and I'm setting you on the back burner and I will deal with you later. And he will. That's what the tribulation is for. He will deal with all the unbelieving Jews during the tribulation. And a good part of the tribulation period will be focused on him doing exactly that. Have you ever had your father say, you sit right there and I'll deal with you later? Boy, I hated that. Because you knew what was coming. Sean, did that ever happen to you? 
Once or twice? <laughs> Emmy, you're so fortunate. <laughs> it was only once or twice with Sean. Yeah. It was probably a hundred times with me. Mm -hmm. But God said to the Jewish people, I'm setting you on the back burner and I'll deal with you later. And so when you think about this thing of blasphemy, not, not the age of women not to allow God's word to be blasphemed, what's he saying? Don't ever be in a position, ladies, where you're allowing God's word to be blasphemed by your children, uh, by your friends, or anything else. You make sure they understand that they're, they're stepping in some pretty dangerous territory when that happens. And as God's kids, we're supposed to guard against those things happening and never let it happen. Amen? Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Next week we'll be in Titus 2, and we'll head to the young men. So, Steve, next week we'll be talking about you. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity today to look into your word. And, Father, we pray that you give us a good rest of our day today. And, Lord, just help us to have a good week this coming week. And that, Lord, we would be about your business. And, uh, and we would make sure that we're sharing our faith and the fact that the belief on Christ is what makes all the difference. And so help us this week, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.